Well, good morning. All right. All right. Merry Christmas. Yeah, it's Christmas time. It's fun. I'm glad you guys are here. If you're a guest today, my name's Trey Kelly. Uh, I'm the lead pa- Always got to love it. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're joining us online, man, thanks so much for being with us. It's Christmas time. I love Christmas time. It's my favorite time of year. I get excited around Christmas. Um, I love Christmas decorations. I do not like Christmas decorating. But I love the result. I love. I don't like the don't like the process. Um, let's just get it out of the way at the beginning. I want to dive straight into what we're going to be thinking about for the next few weeks. Is what I'm thinking about. What you're thinking about. What we're all thinking about. That's uh, gifts. So you thought I was going to say Jesus because we're in church, and I hope you think about Jesus. But you are thinking about gifts right now because this is the time of year where there's a lot of pressure to give gifts and to receive gifts and. Are they going to like the gift I gave, and what are they going to give me? And the always fun, what if they get me a gift and I don't have them a gift? So you keep, like, the spare gifts in the house just in case. And so uh, since you're all thinking about gifts, and I'm thinking about gifts, and we're all thinking about gifts, um, some of us in the room, me included, has, have a little bit of a deficit when it comes to gifts. I'm not always the best gift giver. I can't always come up with ideas. And so I thought as we started today, I'd kind of do a public service announcement for all the <clears throat> men in the room who maybe are bad at gift giving. And so what I did is I did some research for you. There's a, a, a marketing expert. His name's Russell Belk. And he wrote an article, uh, Six Keys to a perfect gift, six characteristics of a perfect gift. So real quick, if you want to take some notes, men, you want to take some notes, men, hey, dads, men, write, write these down. Uh, six characteristics of a perfect gift. Number one, the giver makes an extraordinary sacrifice. This doesn't have to be financial, but a gift should cost us something, some time, some effort, some energy. And so if you're about to give a gift, it didn't cost you anything, reevaluate that gift. It's definitely not going to be a perfect gift. All right, number two. The giver wishes solely to please the recipient. A perfect gift is for someone else. Again, husbands, this is why when you bought your wife that new television for the den for her birthday, she wasn't real thrilled with it. It wasn't like, hey, it's just, no, because it was for you, not her. So also, the gift is a luxury. It doesn't mean expensive, but a perfect gift is going to be something you want, not something you need. We need socks, not great gifts. All right, let's keep going. The gift is something uniquely appropriate to the recipient. Again, this shows that you spent some time thinking about them, what they need, what they want. It should be appropriate to them. The the, the recipient is surprised by the gift. This is kind of hard to pull off nowadays. But but if you can actually surprise someone with a gift and they didn't know it was coming, man, that that adds extra to it. And the last one, the recipient desires the gift and is delighted by it. Now, if you've done one through five, they're going to desire it, and they're going to be delighted by it. So I hope you, hope you took those notes. hope you wrote those down. And I know some of you are already wondering, maybe rolling your eyes a little bit, be like, you know what, Trey? Christmas is already so consumerized and so commercialized. Do we really need to talk about giving gifts in the Lord's house? I understand that, and I'm about to Jesus juke all of you. <laughs> because Christmas is the celebration of the perfect gift. Let's look at it again. Perfect gift. The giver makes an extraordinary sacrifice. Our Heavenly Father sacrificed His one and only Son to have a relationship with us. Look at the next one. The giver wishes solely to please the recipient. The gift of Jesus was for us. God didn't need us. God wasn't up in heaven saying, man, I hope they get their act together. God was perfect and completely satisfied. The gift of his son was solely for our benefit. The gift is a luxury. Now, please hear me. I believe Jesus is a necessity to life, but he's also not a pair of socks. When Jesus is in our life, he guarantees us the best life possible. Love without fail, peace, satisfaction, contentment, all things that make our life better. The next one, the gift is something uniquely appropriate to the recipient. This is the amazing thing about a relationship with Jesus. It is completely personal. Jesus is not going to spend one second of his time with you comparing you to someone else, asking you why you aren't more like someone else. He's not interested in someone else. He created you to play your role in his story. So anytime we experience Jesus, we lean into Jesus, we have a relationship with him, it is completely and totally appropriate to us. He is always looking 
to grow us, to grow our strengths, and to develop us into the man or woman he created us to be. It's completely and totally unique to us. The recipient is surprised by the gift. You've been a Christian for a while. You may have forgotten what it felt like the first time you realized what the God of the universe did for you and what he did for me. That even though we rebelled, we sinned, he loved? That's surprising. And the last one, the recipient desires the gift and is delighted by it. Here's the thing about desires. Every one of us in the room that consider ourselves a Christian knows there was a time in our life where we tried to fill the void of Jesus with something else. And we did not find the satisfaction until we turned to Jesus. And if you're here today and you would not consider yourself a Christian yet, welcome. We are so honored you're here. We've literally designed our church to be a safe place to check out the things of God. And here's what I hope you'll discover. That thing you've been longing for, that, that peace, that satisfaction, that contentment that we've all been chasing our entire lives will be found in Jesus. He will satisfy those desires and we can truly find our way to delight in him because he really is the perfect gift and that's what we celebrate at Christmas the fact that God chose to give us this perfect gift that's why we're calling our series glad tidings it's just another way of saying good news good news God loved us so much he gave his son good news it's a free gift good news our God gives many gifts See, I don't want to just focus on the gift of Jesus today. I want to focus on the gifts of Jesus today. Because see, Jesus came just to give us more than his life. He came to give us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and joy. So many gifts that if you consider yourself a Christian for some of us, these gifts have been in our lives so long that it can be easy to take them for granted. It can be easy to even forget we have them. And if you're here today and you don't consider yourself a Christian, you may not even be aware of the gifts God's made available to us. Have you ever needed something only to realize later that someone had given it to you years ago? That happens to, to me and Danielle. We got married Almost 20 years ago now. Wow. You look good. <laughs> Notice I didn't say we. Almost 20 years. And when we got married, I don't know if people still do this. When we got married, you know, you would go to department stores and you'd take this little gun and you'd register for things that people were going to buy you. And because people told us we had to, we registered for like regular plates and then fancy plates. You know, you had your regular china and your fine china. And these fine people gave us this fine china that we packed in boxes before we moved to Texas to go to seminary because our apartment was about the size of this table. And so we, we had to pack it away. We moved back to South Carolina. The boxes came back. I don't think we unpacked that fine china for 15 years. We've still never used it. We have never ever used one of the plates, one, nothing. We've never used it, but we have used one part of the fine china. This is where I have to admit something to you, and I'm going to ask you to be kind. Okay, I'm going to ask you not to judge me for what I'm about to say. Um, I'm pretty particular about certain aspects of my life. My wife says that's an understatement. <laughs> I am a little bit of a silverware snob. Um, and what I mean is, I, I think I've lost half the room. Like, what does that mean? I like heavy silverware. I like substantial silverware. Like, I want to use two hands to use the knife. Like, I want a heavy fork. I want a heavy spoon. I want to feel it in my hands. Like, I don't like using plastic uh, silverware or like what I call cafeteria silverware, you know, where like the fork is like so thin, it just, it can bend it. I like a really substantial, heavy 
fork. And we bought heavy forks when we were, when we were young because I, I, I wanted them. And then I had children, and they decided to destroy the forks and just, like, take them outside and play with them and build forts with them and who knows what. And so we were running out of forks, and I was like, we got to have more forks. And so I started searching online for heavy forks, <laughs> how, to buy, how to find new forks. I really did. I was like, I could go to a store because I got to feel it. I got to feel the fork before you buy it because this isn't right. And my mom was over. My mom goes, well, what about your fine china? I was like, we don't use your fine china. She goes, yeah, but you got silverware too, right? I said, yeah, we did. And so she went in the back of our pantry and pulled out one. And guys, when we opened the container, it was one of those moments where like a light shined down. And I think it was, I think heaven went, ha, ah, because the silverware, oh, we've never used the cups. We've never used the plates, but I'm, thank you, Jesus, we picked that silverware because it is the heaviest, most glorious silverware. I mean, it is, I'm sorry, it is fantastic. <laughs> and it was packed in a closet for 15 years. And I had no idea. Are you aware of all the gifts God's given you? Gifts that will bring joy to your life. Gifts that will bring peace to your life. Gifts that will make things so much better. And you know about them at one point, then you packed it away. But it's there. Tucked in the back of a closet. In a box labeled garage. These gifts that our gracious Heavenly Father means for us to use 24-7, 365. They're there and we've forgotten them. Or they're there and we never knew they were available. And so what I want to do today for the next few weeks is just highlight a few of those gifts. Gifts that God knows would make our lives better. That are freely available. And all we have to do is use them. And so today what I want to do to kind of begin our, our conversation, I want to turn to a man named Peter. Uh, Peter was one of Jesus' best friends, one of his closest disciples. If you were here a few months ago, we did a series called Boat Life. And Peter was kind of a star of that series because Peter's the guy, if you ever heard the story, Peter's the guy that walked on water with Jesus. Um, Peter's also the guy that in a moment of crisis, he denied knowing Jesus three times. Uh, but Peter also, when Jesus died and came back to life, Peter led the early church. He preached the first church sermon in the history of the New Testament church. He preached it, and 3,000 people became Christians that day. Peter continued to be a leader in the early church, Peter was the first person to take the message of Jesus to the Gentile world. Any non-Christians, I mean non, non-Jewish people, he, he, he stepped outside of his own tribe to share this message with the world because Jesus has said this message is going to be global. Peter remained a leader in the early church until the Roman government had had enough of Christians and they began a persecution of Christians that involved killing James, the brother of um, John. Then they also killed James, the brother of Jesus. Um, they eventually would kill Peter. Um, they'd also kill Paul. And there was a persecution happening of these early Christians as, as the Roman Empire desperately tried to stamp down this movement that they wanted no part of. And in the height of this persecution, the Holy Spirit led Peter to write two letters, two letters to Christians enduring persecution, enduring this uprising, enduring this, this battle going on, this government trying to stop their movement. And in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, he addresses that issue. One of the commentators I uh, read for this series literally described 1 Peter as a handbook for ambassadors in a hostile land. And so that's, who's, that's who Peter's writing to. And at the very beginning of his first letter, when he's talking to them, I am convinced he was speaking to us. And he gives them and us a reminder of this amazing gift that our Heavenly Father has intended us for, for us to have the entire time and that we sometimes miss but we really can't live life without. 
And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we're going to start in verse 3. If not, it's going to be up here on the screen. But don't forget who Peter's writing to. He's writing to Christians who are actively being hunted and persecuted for their faith at the risk of imprisonment, beatings, and death. And here's what he says. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. All praise to God. Why? Because God is the giver of all gifts. Because God is the author of everything. And what Peter's saying is, hey, even in tough times, guys, we're going to praise God. And you might say, why? And Peter says, well, I'll remind you. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again. Now, remember, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have placed their faith in Jesus. And he's saying, of course we can praise God, even in these circumstances, because we have been born again. Born again is a term used over and over and over in the New Testament to refer to what happens when someone becomes a Christian. And you may say, well, why do we have to be born again? And the answer is because Christians believe that we were born separated from God. We were actually born pre-wired to distrust God. We were born predisposed to sin. We were born selfish. We were born greedy. We, we were born not thinking about other people. This is why your infant has never cared that you were tired. Doesn't matter because that's how we were born. And because we were born into this sin, we were born separated from God because God can't be around sin. In fact, the only thing God can do with sin is destroy it. So we were actually born with a death sentence. We were born doomed to be separated from God, which is why he sent his son, Jesus. Because what Jesus came and did is Jesus came and lived a perfect, sinless life, never made a mistake. And then when he willingly laid down his life, he and his dad had made an agreement. See, his dad had to punish sin. He didn't necessarily have to punish us. And so what Jesus said is, all right, Dad, here's what I'll do. I'll take it all. All the punishment for all the sin in all the world for all time. Punish me. Because I'm perfect. I've never messed up. So I'm a sacrifice worthy of wiping away all that sin. And his dad said, yep, you are. That's how we're going to fix this. And so when Jesus died on that cross, God literally substituted him for us. Rather than punishing us, he punished Jesus in our place so that the sin could be wiped away once for all time. So that when God looks at us, now he doesn't see sin. He sees us. He sees someone he loves when we place our faith in him and when we choose to follow him. But that's just half of it, right? He died to set us free from sin. But we are born again because of something else he did. Look at this. We're born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. See, the resurrection wasn't just a really cool finale to the story. The resurrection wasn't just, let me show you how cool I can be. The resurrection was the end of the process and the promise that Jesus came to give us. Because what God was doing through the resurrection was giving me and you a picture. A picture of God's power. He can raise the dead. And a picture of God's promise. What I've done for my son, I'll do for you. And because we have a God who can raise the dead and he proved it, when we become Christians, we can be born again. The self that was born, pre-wired to, to, to distrust God, can be done away with. And we can be born again a new person. A person with the capacity to overcome their evil desires. A person with the capacity to overcome addictions. A person with the capacity to love. And with the capacity to forgive. And with the capacity to be satisfied despite circumstances that no one would be satisfied with. That is what it means to be a Christian. Because Jesus died and came back to life, we can be born again into a new, better life where we can become the men and women that God wants us to be. 
And so to this group of people struggling, to these group of people who are being persecuted, Peter says, hey, 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 before we, before we go any further, let's give it up for God. Because of him, we've been born again because we have a God that raises the dead. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that because what Peter's going to say next is the gift that we're talking about today. But you, don't, you can't have the gift until you understand where the gift comes from. The gift comes from our Heavenly Father who through his power we can be born again. And when we get that, here's what Peter says. Because of these things, now we live with great expectation. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of struggle, we live with great expectation. What's another way of saying great expectation? Hope. See, Jesus gives the gift of hope. Grounds for believing that something good may happen. That is the gift that is freely available to me and freely available to you every single day of our lives through Jesus. We have permission to hope things will get better. We have permission to hope things will get better when we get bad news from the doctor. We have permission to hope things will get better when our kids make choices that we can't possibly fathom. We have permission to hope that things will get better when she stops returning our calls. We have permission to hope that things will get better when the business closes its doors. What Peter is saying to a first century church struggling with persecution is, hey, 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 you have permission to hope. What he's saying to me and what he's saying to you at all times, in all circumstances, despite what's happening, you have permission to hope that things are going to get better. And you may say, why on earth? Why? Why would I hope things We'll get better. You don't understand what's going on in my life. You, you don't know what I'm going through. Hope. Hope's for other people, man. I'm fine with contentment. I'm fine with, I, I've made my peace with it, but no, no, sir. No, sir. There's no hope here. And Peter's like, I, I thought you might say that. So let me explain why. I have permission to hope, and I think you should have permission to hope as well. He keeps going. He says, we we live with this great expectation. We live with this hope because we have a priceless inheritance. It's an inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Now, again, we're talking about Christians here. And he's saying, hey, if you're a Christian, if you've been born again, you have permission to hope because there's an inheritance waiting for you. And I love the fact that he used the word inheritance because the people who inherit are heirs. And what he is saying is, When we become a Christian, what we believe as Christians is that when we are born again, we are born again into God's family. God literally adopts us. We become his sons. We become his daughters. That's how we can have his inheritance. Because we have the legal right to said inheritance. And so what Peter is saying is, hey, 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 despite what's happening today, there is a future for you. There is an eternity for you that is waiting there that cannot change. No one can take it away. No one can steal it. No one can, no one can destroy it. And you can trust your Heavenly Father is going to deliver that. I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, great. So I'm supposed to have hope because of heaven. My life is terrible today. It's hell on earth, but hope because of heaven, right? If you grew up in church, you probably heard that. Well, you know, heaven's coming, so you should just endure it today. But see, that's not all Peter says. Peter does say yes. Despite what's happening, as Christians, we can step back, take a global perspective, and say, okay, you know what? We know the end is secured. We do have that hope, despite what's happening today. But Peter doesn't stop there. That's not the only reason you should have hope. That's just the beginning of of your hope. He's just trying to remind us of something because he's about to make an argument. So reminder, Christian, the end is secured. Reminder, anyone in the room who's not a Christian yet, all you got to do is believe in Jesus and the end is secured. It is by believing we are saved. And once you have that foundation of the end, then Peter says, okay, so here's how we deal with the here and now. He says, through your faith, through your belief, God is protecting you by his power right now. 
until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. See, so we have hope not just in the, 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 the promise of tomorrow. We have hope in the protection of today. The image Peter is using here, the, 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 the Greek language he's using, when he talks about protection, is military language. And he's basically painting the picture of a group of people huddled inside a military base. A military base guarded on all four sides and an enemy on the outside. And he's saying, that's who you are, Christian. That's who you are in this world right now. Your heavenly father has surrounded you with the walls of a military base. And he is actively working and protecting you today against the things that are coming towards you. That's who God is. Not just a God promising a future for tomorrow, but a God actively fighting to protect me and you today. Even when you can't feel it. Even when things seem to be a struggle, what Peter is saying is, you can hope, you can believe, because your God has a promise for tomorrow and is fighting for you today. And then he closes this way. He says, so be truly glad in the midst of your persecution. Be truly glad in the midst of your struggle. Be truly glad in the midst of your hopeless moment. Why? Because there is wonderful joy ahead. There is, not there might be, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Hey, good days are ahead. You can believe in those. You can hope in those. Tomorrow might be rough. But Jesus has a future for you, and he's fighting to protect you. So don't let today deter your hope. You know why? You know what, you know what Peter's really saying? What he's trying to remind me, what he's trying to remind you, what he's trying to remind all of us when we find ourselves in the darkness, we find ourselves in the hopeless caverns where everything seems big and God seems so small. Here's what he's reminding us. What's happening now doesn't determine what's next. Do you know that? Just because things are bad today does not mean they'll be bad tomorrow. And again, this isn't some pie in the sky, pray it away. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I can tell you, in my life personally, God rarely, if ever, does exactly what I want. Thank God. And he rarely, if ever, moves as fast as I want. But I'm 41 years old. And I can say this conclusively. He always, in the end, does more than I could have ever imagined. That's who my God is. And if you consider yourself a Christian, that's who your God is. And so despite the circumstances, despite the struggle, despite the news, what Jesus is trying to remind us is you have permission to hope that things are going to get better. And you have permission to walk with joy in your life, even though things are struggling, because you have a God who loves you. You have a God who has a future plan for you, and you have a God who is fighting for you today. So let's be joyful, even if we have to endure for a little while. Just because we're enduring today does not mean we will endure tomorrow. You know why? Because Jesus gives us hope. Because Jesus says, I love you so much, I gave my life for you. I want to lead you every day. I've got an eternity plan for you, and I am fighting and protecting you every day. I am orchestrating things you aren't aware of. I am moving things behind the scenes. You don't know what's going to happen, but trust me, I do, and it's better than you think. So you have permission to hope. And I know for some of you, you're just like, man, hope's gone. No. No. I'm not interested in hope. One of my favorite movies of all time is about hope. And I always have to give a disclaimer anytime I talk about a movie. This is not me recommending you show this movie to your five-year-old. This, I'm not saying the movie is perfect. I'm not saying it's the Bible. I'm saying it's a movie I like. And the movie, I want to tell you, is The Shawshank Redemption. Please don't show it to your children. But I love, I love this movie. I love this movie. I've watched it, I don't know how many times. If you're unfamiliar with the story, it's 
the story of Andy Dufresne, a banker who was innocently, uh, who, was, who was framed for murder and gets convicted of murder. He did not commit the murder. He goes to Shawshank Prison where he meets Morgan Freeman who plays Red. Red calls himself the only guilty man in Shawshank. Um, Red also committed murder as a young man. And the movie tells the story of their friendship over about a 20-year period of time. Andy, the eternal optimist, Red, the hardened criminal. And one of the pivotal points of the movie, Andy's just endured something, and the guys were asking him, how'd you get through this? And Andy says, it's because I have hope. And he and Red begin to have a fight because Red's been in jail too long. He's like, man, hope has got to go. In fact, here's what Red says. He says, he says hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. And here's the thing. Red's right. He is right about false hope. False hope is dangerous. False hope can drive a man insane. That false hope that if I just get this one deal, everything's going to be okay. The false hope of if we just have another child, it's going to heal our marriage. The false hope of she hurt me, and so if I just hurt her back, then I'll feel better. That's false hope. That is dangerous. That is deadly. But real hope, the hope Jesus offers, is life-changing. So they have this argument, and a few more years go by, and then... Andy has a conversation with Red about if they ever get out of prison. And Andy talks about where he would go. And it's this beautiful beach in Mexico. And he tells Red, hey, if you ever get out, I'd love for you to go to this place in Buxton, find this rock. And Red's real confused. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, I'm about to spoil it completely. (laughs) But it's been almost 30 years. You've had time. So that night, Andy escapes from prison. He gets out. This warden had been using him and manipulating him. He gets out. The warden gets in trouble. And Andy hopefully makes it all the way to to Mexico. Years later, Red is finally let out on bail. No, probation. And uh, he he does what Andy asks, and he makes his way to the field. He, He finds the rock, and he finds the letter, and... Andy's basically like, hey, you've made it this far. I'd love for you to come live with me in Mexico. Here's some money. And the music's just playing, and it's beautiful. And Morgan Freeman, as read, reads a letter that Andy wrote him. And Andy wrote these words in the letter. He says, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. See, the reason we have permission to hope is because our hope is in a man that never dies. He died and he came back to life. And he lives. And because he overcame death, he can do anything. And so we have permission in his name to hope, to believe, to trust, to expect that good things can happen. Even in the darkest of circumstances, Peter's trying to remind us, hey guys, don't forget, what's happening now doesn't determine what's next. What if they'd stopped writing the Bible on Saturday? Jesus died on Friday. What if it had just stopped on Saturday? What if that was the end of the story? What's happening now doesn't determine what's next. You stop on Saturday, you miss the miracle of Sunday. Peter lived that. Peter made the biggest mistake of his life the night his Savior was taken from him. And then he watched him walk out of a grave. Peter's not spreading false hope, guys. Peter's saying, we got a God that raises the dead. So what's happening now doesn't determine what's next because the Jesus I know gives us hope. And so wherever it is you need hope today, 
whatever feels broken, whatever feels gone, cling to Jesus. Turn to him. Because he has a future for you. And he's actively fighting today to protect you for it. And he says, hey, trust me. You might have to endure trials for a little while. But great days are ahead. And me and you and all of us have permission, even in our darkest moments, to hope. It's right there. It's freely available. We just have to pick it up and cling to it in the dark moments. Let me pray. God, we love you so much. Father, we're so thankful for your son. We're thankful for the hope that you provide through him. Um, God, I pray for the broken hearts in the room. I pray for the hurting hearts. I pray for the hopeless outlooks. God, I pray today will be a reminder that we don't have to go searching for hope. We don't have to buy hope. It's freely available through your son. God, I just pray hearts are restored. God, I pray you put the wind back in our sails. Give us the capacity to step another day because we know what's happening now doesn't determine what's next. And your son does give us hope. So, Father, give us the capacity to cling to it today. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.